Hello there, dear ones. Leah Fiore here again for Take Me to Eternity. Today, I want to talk about the importance of reading our Bible. So many times we read our Bible, and because we don't feel like reading it after that, we don't continue. Maybe we read a bit here and there. Maybe we only read it when we feel the nagging need to do so, or only read the parts that make us feel good. Some of us only know any of what it says because of sermons and memes. I want to say I totally understand, but it's wrong and absolutely unbiblical. We're supposed to read our Bible, not as a legalistic reading to be saved, but reading to understand the one who saves us and how and why he saves us. 2 Timothy 3, 14-17 says, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and from your childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Part of being convinced is knowing that what we believe is really real. Part of it is knowing well enough to understand what we believe. If all we know is what saves us, we're doing ourselves a great disservice. Are we saved? Absolutely, if we believe the gospel, as it is written. But life is so much harder when you do it your way and fumble through it without understanding the rest of God and how amazing he is, how he wants us to live, and how our role is different than his role. I believe that anxiety, for the most part, stems from a wrong idea of God, and that can be cleared up with biblical understanding, and not a read-it-and-walk-away kind of thing. In order to keep our thinking biblical, we need to sit in the Bible often. It's so easy to veer from godly thinking to worldly thinking and justify it and think it's still godly, or we don't have time, we'll do it later. It's so easy to slip a little bit of self into beliefs and not realize it isn't a godly belief anymore. That's part of why we must continuously sit in the Word. People are hungry for God and His presence, even the ones who don't believe in Him, or should I say, don't profess to believe in Him. They're so hungry for Him and His presence and an experience but the people that I see the most wanting an encounter don't go to the one place they are certain to have one, the Bible. If you're desperate for God, read your Bible. If you feel like you're not enough, like you're not being seen, read your Bible. If you want to hear his voice, read your Bible. If you want to hear it audibly, read it out loud. It's the only surefire way to hear him. Not that he can't speak in any other way. But that's not the typical way for you to hear him. If he speaks to you audibly, well, you're going to know it's him and there's going to be no doubt. But even in the Bible, that was rare. So I'm not sure why people think that it's normal nowadays. The Bible gives you the wisdom that leads to salvation. It's there to teach us and correct us, to train us in how to live and be. It equips us. I don't know about you, but I have to be reminded often of some things and unfortunately, when it comes to the assurance of love, or the fact that it isn't all on me, I have to be reminded a lot. I spend a lot of time praying about being the person God wants me to be, and it's only through consistent time in prayer and in the Bible that I feel even almost equipped. If I am not in my Bible for even a few days, I can feel the difference. The confidence in His role in my life fades. The confidence in my ability to live a life that's a reflection of him goes out the window because I sound more and more like me and less and less like him the less time I spend talking to him and listening to his word. And I don't mean that voice in my head that people say is God that sounds so much like myself. I believe if God is going to speak to you, you'll know it's him. There will be no doubt. He isn't wimpy in need of the right frequency and you don't have to work to hear him. He's God. If he wants you to hear him, you'll hear him. 
I feel like the Israelites in the Old Testament, watching God work and then forgetting and turning from him so quickly, over and over again in the Bible, we see people doing great until they take their eyes off of God and focus on themselves or the world. Over and over they did things that were right in their own eyes and things that angered the Lord. As soon as our eyes are on someone else's life experience or looking internally for our own inner voice, they call God, we're doomed to falter. The Bible is about Jesus, and we need to keep our hearts and minds focused on him, not ourselves or experiences. We need to remember his sovereignty and his holiness and our lack thereof. An experience is great, but every experience needs to be held up to what the Bible says. We really need to fear the Lord. There needs to be a part of us that understands the implications of hell for eternity. We don't get saved to not be in hell, but there should be a fear of the one who could send you there. Even more than you fear the wrath of your parent, you should fear the wrath of God. Unfortunately, most people don't even understand the importance of fearing the wrath of their parents, and that's part of the problem with us not keeping God in his proper place and us in ours. We have an unhealthy imbalance in respect. I believe that when the word fear is used in the Bible, it's used on purpose. We as believers don't need to fear God's wrath because we're clothed in Jesus' righteousness. We should, however, fear the wrath of the Lord for those who are still perishing and not forget we were once like them, dead in our sins, destined for eternal damnation. For those who are not saved, the wrath of God is still on them. You should tremble at the thought of anyone burning in hell for eternity. You should know God is mighty and know it to your core. Know that God is in control and we're puny little humans and he is our mighty creator. Reading your Bible shows you these things. It shows you God's holiness too. It shows you just how different we are from him and puts you in your rightful place and he in his. Satan, I'm sure, loves for people to be told they're Christians and them to go no further, to have a false conversion, false assurance of faith, when they're still headed to hell. I know tons of people who claim to be Christians, yet have no clue what that means and no fruit to show that they are. I'm not claiming to know a man's heart. I just know so many people who say, say they are going to heaven, when in fact they don't even really like the God they claim to follow. That's why I have such a hard time with the sinner's prayer and a lot of the preaching that goes on. If we have a false sense of security, it's easy to live however we want to and not think we're doing anything wrong. We live in a time of hyper grace where people say, Jesus loves you so much. He loves you just the way you are and all you have to do is say that you believe in him and you'll go to heaven. When in reality, that isn't so. People say what God says is a sin, is holy, and we need to be more loving and less judgmental. But if it isn't our judgment, then it isn't us being judgmental. We're just saying this is true or this is false. Truth matters. A while back, I did some digging into what it means to believe on Christ, because to me it just sounded weird and I didn't know what it meant. The 1828 Webster Dictionary says to believe in is to hold as the object of faith, while believe on is to trust, to place full confidence in, to rest upon with faith, to simply believe he is the Son of God who lived and died on the cross, isn't any different than the demons do. They know who he is. They even tremble. What's the difference between you and them? We need to hold him as the object of our faith and put our full confidence in him, to know that he is our Lord and Savior and trust him to be. There's a love for him that we must have, and in loving him, just as with anyone else that you love, you're going to want to know him, and not just know him, but please him. Hopefully more so because we're talking about God here. The only place to look to know him is the Bible. Reading the Bible doesn't save you. Jesus does. But if you don't even feel the need to know him, why would you call yourself his follower? If you reject what he says about himself, then you reject him. Jesus told us a lot about himself, who he is, and how he wants us to live. 
While we can do nothing to save ourselves, we ought to love him enough to want to be obedient, to want to please him, or else how do we say we love him? I love a lot of people, and to some degree I want to please each one of them. In order to do that, I need to know them and what is pleasing to them. Christ told us that we need to die to self, and to do it daily. He told us that if we love him, we will keep his commandments. 1 John 2, 1-6 through six. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, the one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. One of the points of reading scripture is to understand sin better so that we can avoid it, to know that we have Jesus Christ's righteousness as a cloak for us, and that when God sees us, if you're saved, he sees Jesus' righteousness. We're meant to live as much like Christ as possible. We are to look like him and to reflect him to the world around us. It doesn't make us equal to him, and it doesn't mean we can do all the things he did, unless it's his will for us to do so. He is God, and we are not. But we are to be light. We are to be salt. We are meant to preserve and flavor the world around us with the knowledge of Jesus. We can only do that if we know him and what he says. Now saving isn't up to us, but spreading the gospel is, and planting the seeds. There is a thing going around that says, share the gospel and use words if needed. It's so wrong. The gospel that saves cannot just be shown. You cannot be a light simply by being. You have to shine. It makes me think of when it says, you don't put a light under a basket. Like the light is still there, but it isn't good for anything. An unsalty salt is useless. It's still technically salt, but it does no good for others. If all you do is be a Christian and love people, but you don't share the gospel that can save their soul, you might as well just hold their hand and walk them to hell. You could be the voice that they need, but in order to do that, you need to know the hope for your faith. And when I say no, I mean intimately no deep down to the depth of your core, and that takes time with prayer and reading God's word. 1 Peter 3.15 But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. The Bible says that we are going to be held accountable for every word we say. Boy, do I want to speak rightly of Jesus. I don't want to stumble a brother or a sister. I don't want to make someone else's life harder by telling them untruths or leading them down an alternate path. Now, I don't believe that Christians don't sin or that we're perfect. I personally believe that our entire being should want to want to do as God wants us to do and that we will not be perfect until we're he in heaven. When I say want to want to, I mean, there should be a longing inside us to want to conform to God's will. We will absolutely fall short, but that doesn't mean we can stop trying to do as he says, or stop making an effort to be who he has called us to be. Fight the good fight. Don't give up. Run the race marked out before you. Don't get tired and sit down. Not to earn anything, only to please and honor and glorify the one who made us for his glory. In doing so, we should want to know him and understand him as best as we possibly can. And that's a forever goal. We do that reading our Bible and praying. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5 says, But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience 
as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everyone created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. We need to pay less attention to what people say the Bible says, and more attention to reading our Bibles in their entirety. When did the Bible studies become a study of some person's life experience, and not a study of the actual Bible? If we want to be able to apply what the Bible says, we need to be in the Bible more, studying for ourselves what God says, so he can use it to form us. I don't want to be formed to look like my pastor. Though he's a nice guy and I do respect him, I want to be formed to look like Jesus. Not to say that we shouldn't listen to the many people who have come and lived God-honoring lives and shown the wisdom of what the Bible says, but we should listen to people with our Bibles open, looking to see if what they are saying lines up with the Word of God. And if we, if it doesn't, then we cast them off. There has to be many wise people who have spoken about God honestly and accurately, and we should gain understanding from them, but we should do it cautiously. If you feel like you don't have time to look into the people that you're listening to, then don't listen to them. Read your Bible. Either make sure that the people you're listening to are accurately dividing the word, or just sit in your Bible and pray, because the Holy Spirit and the word is really all that you need. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. It doesn't say that the problem is always with the teachers. The problem is that we often don't want what the Bible says. We would rather do as we please, or be told soft, cuddly things that make us feel good, or have experiences. It's not all on the false teachers. It's on us, too. We want to do what is right in our own eyes. We don't want to agree with God because we like our sin, so we find people who will agree with our sinful wants, and we get duped by the people who preach the things we long for. Money, health, prosperity, experience. We fall prey to the deception that comforts us the most instead of bowing to the one who knows best and can actually give us rest for our souls. John 17:17 17, 17 says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. We are prone to believe wrongly. We are prone to believe what feels good or others say is right. If we are told a lie enough times, we begin to believe it. We can sear our own conscience, but the Bible, with the help of the Holy Spirit, convicts us of sin. The Bible shows us our sin as in a mirror. It's a beautiful way that God speaks to us and guides us. Everyone says that humans don't come with an instruction manual. But the more I read the Bible, the more I have to say they're wrong. The Bible is the perfect instruction manual, when coupled with the Holy Spirit. The Word sanctifies us as well as prayer. If we want to know what is true or good or pure or right, it's all there. It's pretty amazing how a book that was written thousands of years ago can be so applicable today. But as it is said in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. And God's pretty amazing. 1 Timothy 4, 6-8 through 8 says, In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourselves for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It's easy to think that we know enough, and to a point that can be true. You can know enough to simply be saved, but there's so much more than salvation alone in this life. To be a servant, you have to follow someone, and to follow them, you have to understand them and what they want from you. The Bible is our guideline. 
It nourishes our soul and teaches us rightly what unfortunately so many twist and teach wrongly about. If we want to be able to know fact from fiction, or who is teaching us accurately or not, we need to know the Bible. We need to know it well and continue reading it so that we don't slowly slide into wrong thinking, which can not only damage us mentally, but spiritually. It isn't something you can fully know, so we need to stay in it. Hebrews 4, 12-13 says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. There is no coincidence that Jesus said he is the word, through what he has done and said and who he is, his life, all of it was the will of God. When coupled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Bible can be a guideline for us. It can be a source of ultimate wisdom. It can teach us how to be and what to be and who to be. It's just as applicable today as it was when it was written. And though it always means the same thing as it always has meant, God can use the truths to guide us and shape us. It's a never-ending source of wisdom and understanding because the one who helps guide us uses different places to speak to our hearts and situations. That being said, you need to stay in the Word, consistently learning what God has to say, what He wants to speak into our lives. We are to guard the Word as a treasure and store it up in our hearts. We are to meditate on it, on its meanings, to ponder it and mull it over, to think about it continually. Deuteronomy 6, 5-9 through 9 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This verse really resonates with me in this sense. God knows that we're prone to turn and change course, that we're prone to add a little and take a little away, to change it to suit our wants and feelings. He knows that we need to be consistently looking towards him or we'll fall. We will turn away from him and seek after that which pleases us and not him. We need to also be in fellowship so that we can be held accountable. If we want to be a light to the world around us, we need to shine Jesus. If we want to shine Jesus, we need to know him and look like him. We can't look like him if we look like the world, sound like the world, and speak like the world. In order to look like him, we need to be intentional. We need to intentionally know him and imitate him. To not look like the world, we need to understand what the difference is and make an effort to reject what is not godly. Not excuse it, not be okay with it. We are to be different. There will always be a back and forth, your flesh poking through. We aren't perfect like Jesus, but we need to stay correctable, teachable, forever being formed into the image of Christ. The Bible says that Jesus chose us out of the world. Jessie Goss from My Burning Heart blog and podcast was telling me how much she loves in Hosea when God says he will strip Israel of everything and lead them to the desert and speak sweetly to them. It's such a beautiful and sad picture of our Creator bringing his loved ones back to him. How far have we gone astray? Go back to what led you to faith in the beginning, and that's the amazing grace and mercy of God. Our whole reason for life is to honor Him and glorify Him. How can we do that if we don't really know Him? John fifteen eighteen through 21 says, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. 
If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. When we look like Jesus, the people who do not love Jesus are going to have a problem with us. It's inevitable. It's kind of amazing because so many people who you would think would understand don't. And the more you speak up about what God says and share the gospel, the more people will hate you or simply just not like you. You'll be surprised with who you piss off when you start speaking out if you haven't already. But Jesus says, count the cost. He says, we are to love him more than even our father or mother or sister or brother or husband or wife. If we believe what others tell us about Jesus and the Bible over what the Bible says, then our picture tends to get a bit wonky, and our view of what Jesus would do and look like gets askewed. We can only keep that straight through the Word, where we can see what He did and said. We can't divide the God of the Old Testament and the New. It's the same, and Jesus is Yahweh. He is the same God as God the Father, the one whose wrath He quenched for us. I know it's confusing, the Trinity, the Trinity is something that our little finite brains can't understand, how there can be three distinct persons, yet one God. It's, it's just unfathomable, but you know what? We're humans and we're looking at an eternal God. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what will, the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. In order to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, and to prove what the will of God is, we must be in the Word. That's our plumb line, our guideline, our reference. That's where we start from. That's where we end with. Romans 10:17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We have his words recorded for us, the prophetic made more sure. I'm not sure why we would go anywhere else or leave it up to our own brains and hearts to tell us what is right and true. Ephesians 5:25 through 29 says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. We are to not have a spot or a wrinkle or a blemish on us, and by God's grace and through Jesus' work on the cross, we can. We are cleansed by the washing of water and the Word, through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. The Word helps correct us and clean up our wrong ideas, and the Holy Spirit helps convict us and helps keep us in line and not turning to the right or to the left. Ephesians 4:22 to 24 says that in reference to your former manner of life you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth our new self needs to be put on you can't say you are saved and go on living the same life with the same selfishness and worldliness and say you're saved. It's just not how it works. There has to be some kind of change. Whether it's in your heart and no one sees it, I don't know and I don't profess to know who is a Christian and who isn't. But there has to be some difference. Our faith is strengthened through prayer and the word as well as circumstances. We are to be washed by the word, cleansed and made new by the instruction of our holy king. I pray that y'all get into your Bibles. I pray that I stay on fire for Jesus and his word and that I continue to sit in his word daily and grow. 
I just want to get rid of any worldly ideas that I have and replace them with the truth of God. I hope you guys are edified by this message. I really love you and I pray for all of you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, please bless us with a hunger for you and your word. Thank you for your amazing provisions. Help us to see your hand in all things, even when they're hard and painful, even when others cannot see your hand working. Help us to know you are always there working all things for the good of those who love you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.